Good afternoon. The Society for Vascular Surgery is sponsoring an audiovisual archives to feature the outstanding leaders and contributors to vascular surgery. A committee was formed to undertake interviews of our most distinguished and famous vascular surgeons. My name is Peter Lawrence, and today I will be conducting an interview with one of our most distinguished vascular surgeons, John Connolly. Dr. Connolly, it's an honor to interview you today. How did you get interested in vascular surgery? Since from what I've read, your training was primarily in cardiac and thoracic surgery. Well, actually, uh, I've always thought that uh, two of them sort of uh, came together. But when I was in medical school, I did a lot of uh, attending in the operating room with the Mass General. And there was Bob Linton, who I consider the father of uh, vascular surgery in the United States. And so I got very interested in it uh, from him. Uh, also, uh, Darling, his assistant, uh, is a, was the father of a distinguished uh, Albany surgeon that we all know. But then when I was at Stanford later on uh, as a resident, uh, Dr. Emil Holman was a professor, and he was the last uh, trainee of Halsteads. So he ran the residency program at Stanford at that time, very much like Halstead ran the program uh, when he was the chief. We only found out, he, he took six interns, and uh, only one was going to be the chief resident eventually. And each one uh, only found out in May of each year whether they were going to start uh, the second year or the third year. And if they didn't uh, start, then they peeled off in the ENT or something else. And when I was going, about to go into the third year of the residency, Dr. Holman called me in and said, uh, I've arranged for your next year to be at the leading cancer hospital in the world. He said, there's no one here at Stanford that knows anything about cancer, surgery. As a matter of fact, there's nobody in the greater San Francisco area that knows anything about it. So you're going to go to Memorial Hospital in New York City. It's all arranged. I had no interview, nothing. He just did that by phone, apparently. And I said, well, Dr. Holman, uh, that's a, a wonderful uh, idea that you have. Uh, however, I don't want to be a cancer surgeon. Uh, I want to be a vascular surgeon. And he shook his head like that was just terrible. And he, I didn't know what was going to happen to me for that next year. Well, two weeks later, he called me in the office and he said, OK, Conley. He said, I, I heard you. And I've made a different arrangement. You're going to go to London to St. Bartholomew's Hospital for a year. This is the leading, uh, oldest English-speaking hospital in the world. James Patterson Ross, uh, Sir James Patterson Ross is the chief, distinguished vascular surgeon, surgeon to the king, and I think uh, you will enjoy it. So that added up to my interest because when I got there, uh, it was the professorial unit. Uh, there were a number of, of staff who were very interested in vascular surgery. For instance, John Kenmuth, who did the first uh, work on lymphatics, wrote, wrote the book on lymphatics. He did the first uh, method of, of visualizing in some lymphatics. Uh, Jerry Taylor who was a contemporary of mine, was a, uh, became a leading vascular surgeon in London. Uh, there was another young uh, surgeon there who spoke uh, many languages, and we went over to the uh, continent together, and he introduced me to De Bost, Dos Santos, and La uh, all who were leading vascular surgeons of the world, 
And as, as I look at back on it, uh, I think France was uh, th the leading country. So that all added up to uh, an interest in uh, vascular surgery. And I didn't consider uh, uh, the aorta uh, anything different than that connected all parts of the vascular system. At the time that you were meeting these exceptional people who are now considered some of the giants and founders of vascular surgery, did you know how exceptional they were when you were working with them? Not, not really. I guess maybe La Riche, uh, I had heard uh, in our country that he was the father of vascular surgery, but I didn't know uh, that one was going to lead us into in the, in the vascular surgery or etc. Mm -hmm. During your first faculty position at Stanford, you were selected as a Markle Scholar. Uh, first of all, maybe explain what a Markle Scholar is, but more importantly, how that impacted your career, that selection to such a distinguished uh, award. Well, when I was finishing up at uh, Columbia, Victor Richards, who was then the chairman at, at Stanford, uh, said that if you come back and join the faculty, we're going to make you our uh, representative uh, for the award next year. And what they did, there wasn't a lot of money involved, but there was a lot of prestige to it. Each medical school in the country could put up a candidate each year to get uh, the scholarship. And it didn't matter what field they were in. And they selected uh, you or not selected you by the house party technique. So I went to the Broadmoor Hotel in uh, Colorado, and the jury were all non-doctors. They would be uh, uh, head of a, a big law firm, they would be a president of a university, etc. And they were told that there were, say, 25 candidates there, and you're going to live with them for a week. And during that time, the uh, jury also, if they were married, their wives were there. And we uh, had lunch with them, dinner with them, etc. And they were told that academically, they're all the same. What we're interested in is you deciding which five of the 25 uh, are going to be leaders. And so after this was over, you went back home and you either got a telegram saying you were made a, a scholar or not. And every year the scholars had a national meeting someplace in the country. And of course the scholars, it turned out to be all different branches of surgery. Uh, a, a number of them uh, were surgeons, but uh, they, it was a fascinating uh, experience uh, educationally. You founded a department of surgery. What are the challenges of being the first member and the founder of a department of surgery? Well, it was so much different at that time because you were in charge of all surgery. Uh, not, di not different, you were in charge of all the departments of surgery and even uh, uh, I was in charge of anesthesia. And uh, remember Bill Longmire used to call me uh, and say, you know, don't forget, we, we run anesthesia too, you know. And uh, at UCLA, anesthesia was part of uh, the department. Dave Saviston would, would, was doing the same thing, calling me and don't let any of those specialists uh, uh, escape. You're the chairman. So that was a big job. Uh, and when you think back on it, compared to what a chairman's job is now. <clears throat> I understand that you knew one of the pioneers of vascular surgery, Norman Freeman. Uh, why don't you tell us about him and what he contributed to our specialty of vascular surgery? Well, Norman Freeman was uh, from Philadelphia, uh, and he had his training at Yale and at Harvard, and uh, he turned out to be the first 
uh, American surgeon who was a pure American surgeon. After all of this training, he went back to the University of Pennsylvania where he'd started and practiced uh, pure vascular surgery in 1938. But after the war, uh, he was assigned uh, to head up a vascular unit in California of servicemen coming back from the war. There were, I think, three or four such uh, hospitals designated throughout the United States. And uh, one uh, day he was giving a special talk in San Francisco and uh, the chairman of surgery at San Francisco at the time was a neurosurgeon. He was so impressed with his talk that he invited him to be the ch chief of vascular surgery at UC San Francisco. So he did that and Jack Wiley was one of his uh, sort of fir first protégés. And they initially worked together and sort of like in, Huma, in Houston, they competed against one another and they became non-friendly. But uh, some of the things that he did, he did the first triple A uh, aneurysm resection ever. Uh, we hear that DeVos did the first one, but in actual fact, about two months before DeVos did his in Europe, uh, he opened the uh, aneurysm and he took a uh, lumbar, uh, took a uh, vein uh, in the upper abdomen and substituted that for the graft. And that first patient, uh, the graft uh, ruptured. The second one he did, after he had put the vein in, he took patients, some of patients' own blood and put that between the stent, between the graft, and closed the aorta over. And uh, it worked. Mm -hmm. And so two years later, he wrote a follow-up on that. Uh, some what, of the other, other, what other procedures well, there, he did? He did the first fem-fem uh, in, in, the, in the world, although it's attributed to uh, others. He took the uh, vein out in the leg, kept it attached here, and, and ran it subcutaneously over to the other uh, groin. And that's written up in, in California medicine. He also didn't, he, wasn't he involved with the non-invasive testing in the vascular lab? Didn't he do He did the first, he built the first vascular lab in the country uh, in San Francisco. So those are some of the, he did the first in of, uh, of uh, renal stenosis. This was a patient, he was going to do in uh, of the abdominal aorta, and while he was scrubbing, a, a young surgeon, uh, not even in the, uh, in the field of general surgery, said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm going to do this in arterectomy of the abdominal aorta. And the young man said, does a patient have hypertension? And uh, Freeman said, yes, I think he does, you know. And so the young fellow said, let's look at the, do you have an arteriogram? And he said, yes, it's right here. Uh, and he looked at it and there was stenosis of the renal artery. So the uh, young surgeon said, why don't you, while you've got the abdominal aorta open, why don't you reach in and pull out that plug of atheroma that's causing that stenosis? So he did that, and the patient was cured of hypertension. Uh, so that's another interesting uh, uh, first that uh, Dr. Freeman did. Dr. Conley, when, when you started board certification, didn't exist, and I understand that you have one of the first certificates. Uh, what was your contribution to the vascular surgery boards? Well, it was, it was interesting. You know, when I was at uh, uh, Mass General as a medical student, Dr. Churchill, I was scrubbed with him. He was a chairman of surgery at that time there. And he was cussing all the time, saying, you know, they're trying to make a American board of thoracic surgery, and that's going to be the ruination of surgery. We must not 
separate. We must be the same. And it was only after World War II when the surgeons came back, thoracic surgeons came back from the war, that they were able to push through and get a board in thoracic surgery. So in 1982, I was uh, the chair of the Board of Regents, and I was also on the board of uh, um, uh, board of vascular surgery. And it was proposed that uh, a vascular board might be possible. And uh, the chief of American College of Surgeons, Raul Hanlon, was equally against it and, and, and talked the same way that Churchill talked when I was a medical student. And uh, so anyway, uh, we got together and I knew that doctor was against it, but I didn't realize how, how strongly he was against it. But at any rate, we were not able, uh, there, there was Jack Wiley, uh, Fry, and myself, all uh, were there representing the board of, vascular, board of surgery, not the, yet the vascular. And uh, we weren't able to, to get a separate board. But comp we made a compromise and got a board of vascular surgery, would be, which is, would remain under the parent American Board of Surgery. And now I think, uh, gosh, about 3,000, I think. Or, or more vascular surgeons are now so certified. And why was I so in favor of it when uh, doctor, my, my boss was uh, against it? It was because I saw so many uh, badly performed vascular procedures by general surgeons uh, in some of the hospitals that I worked with. And I thought that this would be advantageous very much so for the uh, patient. Do you think that the vascular surgery boards will remain as closely connected as they are now to the American Board of Surgery? Will that relationship continue to exist? Or do you think that they'll become as independent as thoracic surgery? I don't, I don't know. I, I know that the authorities that run the American Board of Surgery uh, are strongly in favor of keeping it the way it is. Uh, so. What will happen, uh, I don't know, but we certainly have, uh, vascular surgery certainly made a great advance uh, by being at least in the relationship they are now with the America Board. You've been one of the great ambassadors in vascular surgery, particularly in Europe, and you've received honorary degrees from the Royal College in Eng of England Ireland and Scotland, as well as Japan. Um, how'd you develop an interest in travel and collaboration with colleagues from around the world, and how did you develop this, this position of being considered ambassador for all of vascular surgery? Well, I suppose that uh, it started with uh, my spending that year in, in England. It was a uh, a great eye-opener, and uh, as I mentioned, I uh, got to see some of the other countries. And when I got my own department, I thought it would be nice to exchange uh, some of our residents, and we were able to do that. Uh, what we did, we would send a single, uh, not a single uh, by marriage, but a single, uh, resident, usually about the third year, and we would trade houses and automobiles and jobs. And at that time, you could send somebody over and they were actually able to operate uh, in London. Uh, no longer can we do that, so that that has been a problem. Uh, another thing that happened, I was interested in selective brain cooling at the time, and the professor, the English professor in Tokyo uh, was working on the same thing. So he invited me to Tokyo as a visiting professor. And uh, 
we got to know one another. And at that time, he said, you know, we don't have any research laboratories or anything. Could I send uh, some of our uh, young men over? So that over the period of time, about 20 uh, Japanese uh, surgeons from Tokyo University, the premier uh, university uh, uh, at that time, and they spent two years with us. And then uh, the arrangement was that they were always going to go back. So that they all went back. And now we have a, a subs subsidiary of the Conley uh, Society uh, in Tokyo. Now you've developed <coughs> quite a following of surgeons that you trained or have developed a relationship with through your travels. Uh, and I guess it culminated in the founding of the John Connolly Surgical Society. Um, what impact has that society had on both you and also the people that you have trained that are now back in their home countries? Well, of course, uh, naturally, I've enjoyed it. We have a meeting every year, uh, usually at the time of the College of Surgeons. And uh, I think it's been mutually advantageous for our uh, former residents to come back to the mother house and uh, uh, learn what we're doing. And, uh, and I think it's worked out well as they has, has been the case in most medical schools in the United States. Your son Peter is now a young vascular surgeon at Cornell. Your brother is a distinguished emeritus professor of neurosurgery from Tulane and Oxner Clinic, and your father uh, was a distinguished, or distinguished surgeon uh, at Creighton. Is there something of a surgical gene in your family, or was it the environment that your family's create, created that led to so many in your family becoming surgeons? I, I don't know. I hope it's the genes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just thought uh, uh, we enjoyed we enjoyed medicine. It's it's changed a lot though. It's 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 so, it's so different because uh, when my father was professor at, at Creighton, uh, there was no salaries for the professors. Uh, they made their money in private practice, so they had to practice and teach at the same time. That's all changed uh, so much uh, since then. But I think that uh, if you live in a family that has had uh, happy uh, doctors practicing, uh, it's a fascinating uh, field. And uh, so I'm happy that some of it uh, happened in our family. Yeah, you must be very proud of your son. I am. Following exactly your career. Well, he's even in vascular surgery. Yeah. I know that you've written about awake carotid surgery, in situ bypass, and spinal cord ischemia following aortic surgery, as well as a number of other topics. What would you consider to be the greatest contributions that you've made scientifically to the field of vascular surgery? Well, uh, one of the uh, research projects, so that it wouldn't be entirely uh, vascular, it's vascular and uh, thoracic uh, was our studies on hypothermia, profound hypothermia. In 1959, I started that uh, research at Stanford. And I might say the interesting thing about Stanford at that time was all of the faculty, the full-time faculty, which were well, five or six surgeons, they all had projects in the dog lab whether they're professor chairman or what, every one of them had a project and spent at least one day a week in the dog lab. And so I started a project at that time, uh, at the same time that Norm Shumway was starting uh, his transposition of the heart. Half of the lab was mine and half of the lab was, was was his. And uh, we did uh, studies on profound hypothermia and we monitored the brain temperature. And we also demonstrated that you could actually 
put a needle into the brain, and not only in dogs, but also in, in patients safely. Because at that time, the questionable thing was, was it safe for the brain? And so uh, I think that that uh, has been the most interesting and worthwhile of the subjects that I've worked on. In finishing up, what, what do you see as some of the greatest challenges to the field of vascular surgery? Going forward, uh, what do you think will be the, the issues that we'll need to confront as vascular surgeons? Well, first of all, uh, over my career, I think that, the, uh, that medicine has become a little bit of business rather than science. science. So I hope that uh, the number of vascular surgeons that are doing basic research, uh, I hope will uh, continue. I don't know what's going to happen with endovascular. None of us know how, whether it's going to be as successful as uh, it appears to be uh, five or 10 years from now. If it doesn't, if it isn't successful, then that's going to change things uh, considerably. Is there anything else that the world should know about the distinguished career of Jack Connolly that I haven't asked you today? Well, I would say uh, about, about uh, context throughout the world. I, th I think it's been the most interesting part of my career, getting to know uh, my colleagues in most countries of the world. And I think we, we know one another better than uh, the members of the State Department because they go in and out of office with administration changes, but we don't. And for instance, uh, I was invited to Iran about a year and a half ago uh, to give some, some talks. And the State Department didn't want me to go, but they said, if I go, uh, they can't stop me. So my wife and I went, and uh, we had, this was right before the uh, election, or very couple of months before the election of the president there, and the whole world was interested in that. And so we got a chance to talk to a lot of the doctors there, and uh, we had, uh, the definite idea that he was going to be defeated, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but when we, we got back home, I was sort of surprised that the State Department didn't call and say, what did, what did you experience? Uh, what did the doctors think and so forth? But I didn't hear a thing because I don't think they thought that uh, doctors should be involved in uh, judging uh, countries. But uh, I, since just, just in, the, in the last uh, six months, I've had correspondence with uh, the Middle East, uh, with several uh, surgeons there uh, in I Iran, uh, not, not back in Iran, but in Lebanon. And uh, I've learned that we can communicate back email to these uh, various countries and, and, and we can continue our friendship. So I think if you younger people have any chance to get to be visiting professors someplace, uh, go. And uh, also you'll have the chance to uh, enjoy not only science and vascular surgery, but uh, the whole country. Dr. Conley, thank you so much for providing insight to both your personal and professional life. Dr. Connolly served as president of the International Society of Cardiovascular Surgery, North American chapter, in 1976. A Harvard College and Medical School graduate, he was selected Markle Scholar at Stanford University and was the chief surgical resident of Emil Holman, who was the last chief resident of William Stewart Halstead. Dr. Connolly was known as an ambassador of American vascular surgery. This is most likely due to his early training under Sir James Patterson as surgical registrar at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, London, England.
Dr. Connolly is one of the few American surgeons to have been awarded an honorary fellowship in the Royal College of Surgeons of England, Edinburgh, and Ireland, respectively. Former trainees in Japan and South America established a John E. Connolly Surgical Society in 1975. Among Dr. Connolly's contributions to vascular surgery are the in situ vein graft, a history of pioneer vascular surgeon Norman Freeman, and his service as co-chair editor of cardiovascular surgery for 10 years. Dr. Connolly passed away in early 2016 in California, surrounded by his family. He was particularly pleased that his son has followed in his father's footsteps, practicing vascular surgery in California.